In our next section, we're going to talk about quality of service within the scope of the service provider networks. And this section is going to assume that you have, up to this point, an enterprise level knowledge of QoS. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about what are the differences between the queuing techniques, the scheduling techniques, the classification and marking. Mainly, we're going to look at how the quality of service features fit into the Layer 3 MPLS VPN environment and how the service provider can deal with the classification, marking, the admission control, and then the uh, actual queuing of traffic as it is received from the customer network and then ultimately forwarded out to the service provider core. Now, as we know, the overall goal of quality of service is to offer different levels of service or different service level agreements to different types or classes of traffic in uh, the network. Now, from a service provider point of view, one of the main goals in order to allow this uh, to have multiple different customers that are buying different levels of service first off is to make sure that as the traffic enters the network that it is following whatever the uh, agreed upon service level agreement between the provider and the customer and this is mainly what we would consider our admission control from the customer edge now typically this is where the uh, the customer would buy some sort of service level uh, with the provider like we may buy uh, transit with 10 megabits per second guaranteed. I may be able to burst up to 20 megabits per second, but anything from 10 to 20 may not be guaranteed, and then anything above that 20 mega, uh, megabit per second would be dropped. So that would be just a, an example of a type of service level agreement that the customer could buy from the uh, the service provider. Now, in order to actually enforce this, Mainly the service provider is going to be looking at either honoring or overriding what the classification scheme is of uh, the customer. So this means that it uh, typically involves the service provider looking at things like the DSCP or the IP precedence values and then trying to correlate these to the MPLS markings which are the MPLS experimental bits that are going to be inside of the MPLS uh, shim header. Now, when we look at some of the differences of like the DSCP versus the MPLS experimental bits, one of the first things that you'll notice is that the MPLS experimental is not as granular as the DSCP values, where DSCP is a uh, 0 through 64 possible, or excuse me, 0 through 63 uh, possible values. So it's uh, 64 values that we could have for DSCP, but MPLS experimental is going to only be 8 values, similar to IP precedence. It's going to be 0 through 7. So this means that when we're looking at actually queuing our traffic in the service provider network, at a maximum we're going to have 8 different possible queues, assuming that we're doing this queuing based off of the, uh, the experimental bits. Now we'll look at some of the different types of uh, QoS models that you can enforce as the service provider and to, uh, to figure out when the traffic is received in from the customer, do I want to change their marking scheme or do I want to leave their marking scheme alone? Do I want the customer markings to have anything to do with the actual queuing uh, that goes in on the service provider's core? And this is going to be uh, completely up to the service provider to, to figure out how to deal with this. So we'll talk about some of the differences of what they call the, uh, the the pipe model of QoS versus the uniform model. Mainly what this means is that uh, either we're going to honor or change the customer's markings and classification as the traffic is, is admitted into the service provider network. Now once the traffic is received from the customer edge, the other big thing the service provider is concerned with is what actually happens when I'm transiting the traffic through the service provider core. So this could potentially be that uh, the service provider is selling guaranteed bandwidth between the customer sites. So maybe we're taking quality of service in conjunction with something like MPLS traffic engineering. And then based on the customer's markings, maybe we're saying that to them, I'm going to guarantee that your voice traffic is going to get priority up to one megabit per second in the core. And that your, your data traffic is guaranteed 50 megabits per second transit, but scavenger classes like maybe... Um, ICMP traffic or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing traffic, that stuff is not going to be guaranteed uh, any bandwidth. And again, this is going to be up to the, the service provider's uh, policy that they are agreeing with the customer, or essentially what the customer is, is purchasing for the, the service level agreement, what the guarantee of the bandwidth is going to be between the, uh, the individual sites. But by default, there's going to be no guarantee of the bandwidth. 
since we're looking at a, a completely packet switch network with MPLS as opposed to some of the legacy circuit switch TDM networks like uh, true frame relay networks or uh, ATM networks or like uh, T1, T3 type networks. There's not really a guarantee of the, uh, the bandwidth between two individual points unless we actually configure the network to offer that guarantee. Now this also means that the service provider has to figure out are there some type of flows that are more important than other ones. Where typical cases for this would be if they're selling multiple levels of service where maybe we have the, the bronze traffic is a best effort. You have maybe your gold traffic is going to be your, uh, your guaranteed. Then maybe your platinum traffic is like your, your low latency video and voice traffic. Where as that goes in from the, uh, the edge and is admitted to the network, we need to make sure that we have some sort of classification scheme that once it gets into the core that we can distinguish that from the non-real-time flows and then make sure that that traffic is uh, prioritized. But mainly, again, from the service provider's point of view, the main goal of this is that we're going to sell different levels of service to different types of customers. If we wanted to offer just best effort service to everyone, then we wouldn't need to configure QoS. We'll just let the, the queues and the traffic fight it out for themselves and then not worry about any of the, uh, the customization. But typically in a real world design, that's not going to be the case. There's going to be some sort of level of service that the customer is, is going to be expecting of the service provider. Then either the service provider simply needs to add more bandwidth and faster uh, devices in the core, or use QoS as, as kind of a, a temporary stopgap to try to, uh, to maximize the utilization of the resources in the core of the network. Now, just like enterprise uh, QoS, since we're dealing with normal IP version 4 and IP version 6 packets, mainly for uh, the transit traffic that we're talking about in MPLS networks, there's going to be two different overall QoS models. Where the first one is considered the int serve or the integrated services model, where the idea behind this is that it's up to the actual endpoint of the network to request a specific type of service for an individual flow as compared to the diff serve or the differentiated services model where the guarantee is going to be based on the actual configuration and the classification of uh, the network. Now in the vast majority of cases we are going to be looking at the diff serve based QoS model. Really the only thing that still falls into the int serve or the integrated services is our resource reservation protocol that is used for MPLS traffic engineering. Now since uh, we are dealing with, dealing with MPLS traffic engineering, we do need to take this into account with our QoS uh, design. And this falls into, again, the, uh, the integrated services along with the, the RSVP, the Resource Reservation Protocol. Now the original design goal of this, of RSVP and the InServe model, was that it was going to be up to the host to figure out what type of service do they need from the network. So do I need guaranteed bandwidth? Do I need guaranteed low latency? It's going to be up to the actual application in order to, uh, to figure that out. Now this assumes that the network would then actually enforce whatever the, the level of service that the application is, uh, is trying to reserve. But from a practical point of view, it's not really feasible to do this because the amount of control plane information that the network then needs to maintain quickly gets out of control. Because think of uh, the service provider may have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of customers, but how many different end applications do we actually have? We have literally millions, tens or hundreds of millions that are going over the internet. So it, it's not really feasible for the, the network to leave the QoS requirement up to the application. There's not going to be a way to actually maintain uh, this state. So really the only case that this is going to be used today is with MPLS uh, traffic engineering. So when we are building our TE tunnels, as we saw before, we can use RSVP to, to ask for things like what is the, uh, the particular bandwidth along the path. We can use those affinity bits of the tunnel to say I want uh, links of this specific color if we're dealing with things like the shared risk link groups, the uh, the, the physical links that fall under the same failure domains in the network. So MPLS Traffic Engineering is going to be using RSVP in order to make these requests of the network. Now one of the key points to remember about this though is that the RSVP reservation is only in the control plane, it is not in the data plane. 
So even though MPLS Traffic Engineering is using RSVP and integrated services in order to ask for the reservation, it's still up to us with the diff serve model to actually enforce these reservations. So this means at the end of the day, if I request 10 megabits per second over one of my traffic engineering tunnels, I'm not actually guaranteed 10 megabits per second unless I have some sort of QoS policy in order to enforce that. Now we're not going to go through a lot of the configuration examples of the the diff serve aware TE or the QoS that goes along with TE because once you configure the traffic engineering tunnels and you simply specify uh, what type of traffic is supposed to go over the link so uh, basically we have like a, uh, a a policy route that specifies do I want MPLS experimental bits 1, 2, 3, and 4 to go over this tunnel and do I want experimental 5 to go over a different tunnel. So once we can get the traffic from the data plane to actually get into the tunnel then we can do the enforcement of the, uh, the reservations in the core by using our normal QoS mechanisms like policing at the edge to make sure that a customer is not exceeding what their admission control policy should be and then in the core we could have different queues that are guaranteed different levels of bandwidth based on their specific markings but the key here is that we have to actually enforce this without any QoS configurations the traffic engineering tunnels aren't actually going to be guaranteed the bandwidth that they are requesting now, in order to do this, then, we need to figure out what are the different markings that we can use in the service provider network to actually enforce the policies, where the differentiated services, or the diff serve model, is basically giving us these different attributes that are held in the actual data plane to tell the difference between the different types of traffic. So it's going to be some sort of marking in the actual packet itself, whether it's a layer 2 differentiation like a layer 2 class of service value in an 802.1q uh, trunking header or an ISL trunking header or it's something like the the frame relay discard eligibility or the ATM cell loss priority all of these would be considered a uh, part of the diff serve model because it's some sort of marking that we're applying on to the packet now from an IP version 4 and an IP version 6 uh, diff serve point of view. This could be either the actual diff serve code point, the DSCP, or it could be the IP precedence, where both of these are going to make up what's considered the IP type of service or the TOS bits that are inside of the IP header. The main difference between these is that the DSCP is a little bit more granular than the IP precedence is. Whereas I mentioned before, DSCP has 64 possible values because it's a 6-bit field, where IP precedence only has 8 possible values because it's only a 3-bit uh, field. Now, one of the, the things that's going to be difficult about actually implementing the diff serve model within the scope of the service provider network is that as the traffic is transiting the core, the routers are no longer going to be able to classify based on the information in the layer 3 IP header whether this is the layer 3 IP version 4 or the layer 3 IP version 6 header because as we know in the MPLS network the routers in the core are not making their decisions based on the IP header they're making it based on the MPLS tag or the MPLS label so this means then that we need to take this marking or the classification that we previously had in our layer 3 header and we need to move it down a layer further into the MPLS header and this is what the MPLS experimental bits or the EXP bits are used to do so this is mainly what we're going to be looking at with the the implementation examples here how do we deal with the traffic as it's coming in on the customer edge so do some sort of enforcement of the uh, the admission control then once it gets into the core, how can we use the experimental bits in order to queue or to police or in to schedule the traffic differently based on its, its differentiated services markings? Now we'll also take a look at some examples from either the customer edge or the provider edge, other types of, of diff serve classifications that we could do with things like access lists, if they could match anything in the, the layer 3 or the layer 4 header or NBAR for network-based application recognition where we could go as high as layer 7 and look into the actual application payload to figure out what type of category that we want to, uh, to put this into. But mainly from the service provider's point of view, they're usually not going to get this granular. They're not going to configure NBAR to match uh, your BitTorrent traffic at the edge. 
they mainly want to look at the uh, the minimum depth of the packet as possible, like into the uh, the layer two and a half header of MPLS for the experimental bits, or maybe the layer three header for the DSCP or precedence in order to make their queuing decision. Because the, the further and the deeper into the packet that we need to look, like if we're doing NBAR for layer 7 classification, it means that the forwarding is going to be that much slower, that we're going to have to take a performance hit. So you technically could use NBAR or, or access list for classification, but in most practical designs, you're not going to do that. You're going to want to look at the, the minimum classification uh, that you can. Now, there's also another hack that we're going to see on this process that comes into a kind of disconnect we run into in the network when we're doing our MPLS label imposition at the PE, so we're adding the labels onto the IP packets as they're coming in, and then the label disposition at the egress or the exit point of the network, where we're taking MPLS labeled packets from the core, taking their labels off, and then forwarding the traffic down to the customer. And the issue that we're going to run into is that we need some way to correlate what was previously in the layer 2 MPLS experimental bits and how should this potentially correlate to the layer 3 DSCP or the layer 3 IP precedence. And it has to do with an order of operations problem of the QoS classifier on the router. And the solution that we're going to use for this is a locally significant diff serve value which is known as the QoS group where QoS group we'll see once we actually get into the, the command line and look at the examples, this is going to be a locally significant value that we can use in order to pass information from the egress to the ingress interface or from the ingress to the egress interface without having to actually remark any traffic uh, that the customer is sending. So this will make a little bit more sense why we would need to do this once we look at the, uh, the final design of how the traffic uh, flow is going to actually look inside of the service provider core. Now once we figured out what is the particular type of traffic which these uh, differentiated service values are going to be used for then we can figure out what are we actually uh, going to do with it. So how do we want to, uh, to deal with the queuing? Are we going to guarantee bandwidth? Are we going to give the traffic prioritization? Are we going to try to put it into a low latency queue? Are we going to put it through some sort of scheduling process like weighted fair queuing or weighted round robin or congestion avoidance techniques like random early detection or weighted random early detection? This is going to be the actual QoS enforcement once we figured out what are the different types of traffic. Now typically in, in the service provider network you would also want to have traffic limitations where this is generally going to be at the network edge where you're either doing a policing or a committed access rate as the traffic is received inbound from the customer which typically is going to match what the customer is doing on the other side which is going to be in their outbound shaper where ideally if the customer buys from the service provider a 50 megabit per second guarantee let's say for example on a physical fast ethernet interface so physically, on the last mile between the, the provider and the customer, we have fast Ethernet, which is physically clocked at 100 megabits per second. But if the service provider says you can only send up to this amount of traffic, maybe 50 megabits per second, the issue is then we have that disconnect between what is the physical access rate of the link, which is 100 meg, and what is the logical rate that we're actually guaranteed, or what's sometimes considered the, the committed information rate, or the CIR. So anytime there is a disconnect between what you can physically send based on the hardware and what the service provider is going to allow, then typically you would want to, uh, to shape this traffic as is leaving the interface. Otherwise, the customer just would be sending at a rate of 100 megabits per second. Then when the traffic rec is received in on the provider edge, the policer is, is going to be dropping a lot of it. So you technically can do shaping inside of the service provider network, but most of the time this is going to fall to the, uh, the customer's responsibility, that they should be shaping their traffic out in order to match the input policing or the input metering of what the service provider is doing on uh, the ingress. Now we'll also, from an actual implementation point of view, once we get onto the command line, talk about what are some of the different ways that we can do this classification and then prepare the traffic to actually go into the different types of schedulers or the different types of uh, queues and guarantees.
Now, the main one that we're going to look at is with the, uh, the modular quality of service where the modular quality of service syntax is nearly identical in regular iOS as it is in iOS XR. So if you know how to do enterprise QoS on your normal uh, lower level routers, then you're not really going to have an issue looking at the, uh, the iOS XR. Luckily, they, they kept the syntax almost identical between the, uh, the two of them. So this means that if we're trying to, to classify traffic based on its, its preset markings, we can match things like uh, match IP precedence, match DSCP, match an access list, match, match the MPLS experimental, the QoS groups, and then we could also change these markings or these classifications by using the, uh, the set command. So typically this is going to be done on the ingress interface from the, uh, on the provider edge router, so facing towards the customer as the traffic is received inbound, and then potentially on the opposite end of the network as the provider edge is receiving the traffic in from the core. Another method we could use to do this is the legacy policing or the legacy committed access rate. Where this, this syntax is not going to be needed in iOS XR, but you, you technically still could do this in regular iOS. You could go directly to the interface and issue a rate limit. Uh, you could also do this through policy routing as well. So maybe if you have some complex policy of like uh, multi-VRF or uh, PBR-based VRF uh, uh, source select, like on your PE router towards the customer, you technically could also use this for your classification and your marking. But 99% of the time, you're going to just use the, the modular quality of service in order to uh, enforce this. Now, really, beyond the, the enterprise level of QoS, if you understand what are the, dif what are the different classification techniques, how do you actually implement this with the modular quality of service? So how do you create the class map? How do you create the policy map? How do you apply it with the service policy? And then how do you do the verification of the counters to make sure that the policy is actually applied? The main jump beyond this is to figure out where in the network is the classification supposed to be occurring and what type of traffic am I dealing with? And mainly, this is where a lot of the confusion for a lot of people comes in with a QoS related to service provider networks. Because there's lots of places, if we were to visualize a, uh, a network here, and let's, let's take a look at the, uh, the diagram I have, where we have uh, two different sites that are part of the Layer 3 MPLS VPN, where Router 2 is the provider edge along with XR1 that are connecting down to the customer edge routers, which are router one and XR2. So let's say, for example, that we have traffic that is trying to get from router seven to router eight. So behind these, there's some sort of applications, like we have a web server behind router eight, and then we have our client. So the traffic is routed to the customer edge. The customer edge then sends the traffic to the provider edge. On this link, the traffic is going to be our native IP version 4 or our IP version uh, 6 traffic. So it's normal, unlabeled IP uh, packets. We know that as the traffic then is received in on the provider edge, provider edge is going to be running the push operation or the M position where the provider edge is performing what we consider the IP to MPLS condition. Or in other words, it's just adding the MPLS labels on top of the unlabeled traffic. Now, since we're talking about this within the scope of layer three MPLS VPN, we also know that there's going to be two labels that are going to be imposed or added onto the label stack. The topmost label being the transport label and the bottom label being the VPN label. Then inside there, we have our payload of IP version 4 or IP version 6, where we know that the transport label is, is trying to get us to the egress PE. So the, on router 2, the transport label is trying to get us to XR1. The VPN label is talking about what our final destination is, like the web server that is behind uh, router 8. Now, as the traffic starts to transit the MPLS network then, the different routers in the core and on the edge on the remote side are going to be performing different operations where router 2 again is doing that push operation or the M position the IP to MPLS condition but as the traffic gets to the core from 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 these routers since they are just provider routers 
they are performing the MPLS to MPLS or what we consider simply the swap operation which is simply taking an input label value changing it to a new label value and then forwarding it out uh, towards the uh, the next top device now as the traffic gets from 6 and goes to the edge XR1 here being the egress provider edge router XR1 is then going to be doing the opposite which is doing the MPLS to IP condition which we consider our POP or our DIS position essentially removing the MPLS stack and then forwarding the native uh, layer 3 IPv4 or the IPv6 packets now the reason that this is significant within the scope of quality of service is depending on where we are applying our classification or where we are applying our QoS policy we need to think about is the router trying to classify based on the unlabeled IP traffic or is the router trying to classify based on the label so we'll see that there are different features that we would do on the customer edge versus the provider edge versus the provider core in order to accomplish the same goal which is to classify mark and to queue the traffic in order to get a, a specific type of service so uh, the, the main key here is that you need to ask yourself as you're developing the QoS policy what type of packet am I dealing with at this individual interface at this particular hop of the network am I dealing with a, a native unlabeled IP packet is it going to be a packet that is labeled with a transport label or a VPN label or if I'm running traffic engineering do I have my MPLS TE label on top of that because that's going to determine what type of QoS that I need to apply onto the packet so again the different types of uh, operations here we have the IP to MPLS which is going to be the imposition or the push operation that's happening in the, the input or the ingress interface we have the MPLS to MPLS condition which is going to be the uh, pushing labels onto uh, the packet like adding the transport label onto the VPN or if we're doing MPLS traffic engineering we may be adding additional labels to the stack in the core where we are swapping the labels between two interfaces so we are removing or deposing one of the labels and adding a new transport label or possibly a new uh, TE label on top of the packet and then at the egress of the network we're doing the disposition or popping the top label in order to reveal the VPN label or maybe we're deposing a traffic engineering label in order to reveal either a transport or a uh, VPN label then again finally we have our MPLS to IP condition which is the final disposition as the traffic is leaving the service provider network going out to uh, the customer now another consideration in addition to these three conditions IP to MPLS, MPLS to MPLS or MPLS to IP is where exactly is the final POP operation occurring where in the vast majority of the examples that we saw previously up to this point we were running the normal condition which is considered the pin ultimate hop popping where the PHP process where we know with the PHP process that as the traffic is moving from the customer network into the provider edge the provider edge router is adding the transport label on top the VPN label underneath and then we have whatever our original payload is as the traffic transits the core of the P routers they are simply swapping transport label 1 as the packet comes in to a new transport label 2 or whatever the value is as the the packet is going out so they're simply changing the topmost label now normally what's going to happen is that when the MPLS label packet gets to the next to last or what we consider the pin ultimate or next to last hop value which in this case would be router 6 router 6 is going to depose or remove the transport label to expose the VPN label which is then going to be sent on to the egress provider edge so in other words it means that when uh, XR1 finally receives the packet that was originated by router 7 it's only going to have a VPN label on it it's not going to have a transport label and where this could potentially be an issue 
is that if we are using the transport label in order to carry some sort of MPLS experimental bits for the point of a QoS policy we're trying to enforce. So this means that if the pin ultimate hop popping where the PHP process happens on router 6, we may lose some details in the markings that we're trying to pass from one PE router all the way to another PE router. And the way that we can solve this type of design problem within the scope of the, uh, the layer 3 VPN is to enable what we consider the ultimate hop popping. That the last hop in the MPLS network or the final egress provider edge router, instead of advertising the implicit null label, which is used to cause the pin ultimate hop popping or the PHP, we can uh, configure that router to advertise an explicit null value where this means that the next to last router or the pin ultimate hop is not going to be performing that disposition but instead is going to be performing a swap operation. Now this is going to be configured simply in global config with the MPLS LDP explicit null in iOS or under the MPLS LDP configuration mode in iOS XR where we uh, simply use uh, similar syntax to advertise an explicit null. But the idea for this is that if we are not using the implicit label from the provider edge to the pen ultimate hop, it's going to allow us to uh, maintain the end-to-end -end propagation of the MPLS experimental bits. But the only reason that we, we would need to do this is if we are using the transport label in the core to try to figure out what particular type of queue that individual traffic is going to go into. So it really depends on how the service provider wants to, to deal with the QoS. We have the option of using uh, the customer's marking. We have the option of changing the customer's marking. We have the option of using the VPN label marking. And we have the option of using the transport label marking. So there's multiple levels deep of the differentiated services that we can use in order to classify the traffic in order to accomplish whatever the end goal of our QoS design is. So from an implementation point of view, the examples that I'm going to go through here are mainly concerned with how do we deal with these classifiers. So when we're doing the, the pin ultimate versus the ultimate hop popping, how is that going to affect the end-to-end the -end markings? Or if we're doing our classification in the IP to MPLS or the MPLS to MPLS or the MPLS to IP, uh, portions of the network, how is that going to affect the configuration and the overall logic of the, the QoS design? Now, some books that talk about this and some of the, uh, the standardization documents that talk about Layer 3 VPN, they break these overall design goals of QoS into two different models, which we sometimes consider the uniform model versus the pipe mode or the pipe model where the main difference between these two, whether we're running in uniform mode or pipe mode, is going to be controlled uh, based on the fact, do we maintain the end customer's marking or are we changing their marking? So as the customer sends us X amount of bits per second of a certain type of traffic, let's say FTP downloads, if they exceed whatever our admission control is, like if we're doing a policer, do we want to change their marking Maybe they had IP precedence 4, and we're going to remark this down to IP precedence 1 or 0. And do we want those markings to, to then influence what is going on in the core of the network? Because again, remember with the MPLS core, since we're doing the classification based on the labels and not the IP packets, there's no way for the core to run something like network-based application recognition or even to use an access list with a class map in order to match in the, the classifier of QoS. So in the core, if we're doing a bandwidth reservation or we're doing prioritization or some other QoS, maybe a random or the detection, the only way that we can do this is based on the layer 2 MPLS experimental bits. So the value that these experimental bits have on the edge of the network as the traffic is admitted is greatly going to affect what the final result is of the end-to-end -end, uh, QoS model. And that's mainly what these two modes, the uniform mode and, and the pipe mode, are going to be concerned with. Where the first of these, the uniform mode, the customer's marking is going to be mapped 
to the experimental bits of the service provider ingress. So let's say, for example, that here we have our layer 3 VPN, and the goal is that we're trying to get traffic again from router 7 to router 8. And let's say that this is some sort of priority application, like maybe this is some sort of UDP uh, video feed. And the traffic comes in from 7 to 1, 1 is the customer edge, 1 is then sending this traffic outbound to the, uh, the provider edge. And let's assume that the application itself that's generating this traffic, maybe it's like an IPTV server, it's using DSCP EF for expedited forwarding which is decimal number uh, 46 for the actual marking. So basically this inside the layer 3 packet, this is telling the network that this should be some sort of priority packet. I ideally want to try to get it into my low latency queue or my priority queue to make sure that it has the minimum delay, the minimum jitter as it's going through uh, the network. But now the problem we run into is that when the provider edge here is doing the IP to MPLS condition or the label imposition, if the MPLS experimental bits do not reflect that this was a priority packet, then when the traffic gets into the core, it may not be able to hit the low latency queue that's pre-configured there. Or to go into a particular traffic engineering tunnel that we're trying to steer the priority traffic into. So the key is that we need to maintain this marking as we're going from IP to MPLS. And this is the first goal of the, uh, the uniform mode, that the customer's marking is going to be mapped to what the service provider's marking is. Now, it's still up to the service provider whether they want to remark uh, the traffic while it's transiting through the network. So they could take that DSCP EF that is going to correspond to MPLS experimental bit 5, they could change that if they want to, depending on whatever their, their QoS config is. But the idea is that it's going to be required that the customer's marking maps to the experimental bit at the edge. Where in the pipe mode, it doesn't necessarily have to do this. The customer's marking could be related to the service provider's marking, but they could likewise be unrelated. Okay? In either case, it's going to be up to the service provider what happens in, in the transit, the net, transit of the network. They could change it or they could leave the marking alone. It's, it's up to whatever the, uh, the QoS design says. But the key now, again, is that when the traffic comes in, in uniform mode, there's going to be a relationship between what was the customer's original marking and what does the service provider's marking say. Then when the traffic tries to leave the network, in the uniform mode, the egress IPv4 or the egress IPv6 traffic that is leaving the provider edge going out to the customer edge, this is then going to be remarked based on the final experimental bits that were received on the egress PE. So essentially this means that if the, the traffic was remarked in transit from the two different customer sites, then the final exit of the traffic onto the customer network is going to reflect this. Where in the case of the pipe mode, it is not going to be remarked. And there's a real easy way to, to think of this, that in the pipe mode, whatever comes in on one side it goes out the other side, and it's not going to be modified. Where in the uniform mode, it, it is going to be, uh, uh, there is a correlation between what's going on on the customer side and what's going on on the provider side. But in, in pipe mode, it's, it's completely transparent. The, the packets go in one end of the pipe, they come out the other end of the pipe, and there's going to be no modification of them. So in other words, with the uniform mode, the customer's marking is going to be dependent on the service provider's marking. In the pipe mode, the customer's marking is completely independent of what is going on in the, uh, the service provider network. So this means that in pipe mode, if the customer is setting all of their traffic to DSCP EF or is setting all of their traffic to IP precedent zero, it's not really going to make a difference because those markings are not translated into the, uh, the MPLS experimental bits. Now we'll see in our next section when we look at the actual implementation of this on the command line, the routers by default do kind of a combination of both of these at the same time, that the customer's marking will automatically be copied into the experimental bits as the label imposition is happening. But the, as the label disposition is happening on the egress side, it is not going to be copied back 
to the customer's marking. So we'll see that if we want to truly implement the uniform mode that the customer's marking copies to the service provider, then on the egress, the service provider's marking copies back to the customer, there's going to be some additional steps that we need to change in the configuration. Where the pipe mode, this is basically going to be the default because we don't care about what the customer's marking is. Unless we manually change it, it's going to be left alone. Then any changes that we make in the core for actually changing our markings or doing any sort of, of queuing, this is not going to affect the final egress of the traffic back down to uh, the customer. So in order to understand this, what we're going to do on the command line is stage a couple different QoS policies on the customer side of the network where one of them is going to be used for accounting the traffic that is received. So as packets are coming in on a couple of the routers, we're going to use a QoS policy to keep track of which traffic is precedence 0, which traffic is precedence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Then likewise, as traffic is leaving out to the service provider network, we'll do different sets of markings based on the type of traffic to figure out as traffic leaves one site of the customer side, and is then received on the remote side, what's the final result of the marking? So was the marking maintained or was the marking changed based on either this uniform mode configuration or the pipe mode configuration inside the actual service provider network?